Sam, for inviting me. I must say we have really probably all interpreted your, your instructions differently. I understood a TED talk with the no bullet points, minimal equations for a general audience, um, which seems to be just another model. Um, so it will be maybe a bit more superficial. But allow me to start with a movie. All of us roboticists in the room, we in the end got into uh, robotics because we wanted to have a robot assistant, we were, we were really hyped up by Hollywood, and in fact, this year is the first robot commercial ever. This was made in 1969 and aired on British television by Unimate because they were so certain and full of themselves that within no time, you would have a, this in a slightly smaller form in your kitchen. Now, when you look at this commercial, <laughs> When you look at this commercial, you r realize they actually had the skills to hack up the home assistant. And <laughs> luckily, society has changed. Um, <laughs> women do have a different role today, luckily. But um, well, when you look at the robot itself, in the end, the programming was very, very similar. And yes, maybe we have slightly better programming languages, we have slightly smaller robots, we have substantially more computation, we have substantially better sensors, but in most of industry, we actually um, still use the same methods. I think the next moment is the only part of the video which was faked, since you will recognize the champagne opening was um, a little bit unnatural. Give it a moment. You can't do that with your robot. <laughs> so, and this puts shame on us as a community, right? I mean, 69 is, is even longer ago than 70, 71, which was mentioned today. Not quite the 47, which you heard about the mobile phones, but um, it really puts shame on us that we haven't managed this. And in the end, we haven't changed so much. We, actually program robots in a very similar way as people used to do back then. <laughs> so why don't we have such robots? Well, in the end, as we all know, we have to hack up an incredible number of tasks if we want to do this, and these have to be very specific. When I mean, you now look at the successes which we have, well, they basically allowed us to create a way, like in industry, that we would basically create an environment where the task would always work. In lawnmowers, in vacuumers, we create an environment which basically always works. So what have we actually, what have we actually been doing whenever we brought robots out of our research labs? Well, we usually adapted the task to the robot. We buried a wire, we arranged our furniture so that it actually fits the robot. And this is really substantially different from what we need when we want to generalize tasks. Since in your generalized tasks, you actually encounter an outcome which is uncertain. And there you can really quote Rutherford, who actually basically suggested how classical robotics works and should work, that we, if you need statistics, if you need probability, well, in that case, we've actually done a bad physics experiment. And so, obviously, from my perspective, that means, well, we should do everything data-driven. We should do this with machine learning. Um, and as you know, as you've seen today, this is a very common thought, but we should definitely not do this blindly, since we have all heard this idea before. We've seen what, what Google creates, and we've also seen in, in Karlsruhe and Munich and more and more places these days, uh, but we've also seen that this undirected search for data requires an incredible amount of data generation because in the end, the key component is in the, way, in the end how we can create effective data generation <coughs> so that we can actually do this on enough trials that we can try things on the real system. And um, we really, well, focused on that, and for that we followed first the human trajectory. Mm -hmm. So how do humans learn? Well, humans usually have a teacher for some basic bootstrapping, 
And wherever we don't have a teacher, we even have a built-in reflex so that we have a locally optimal solution. And subsequently, well, we do a lot of self-improvement. So we followed this trajectory and we started out by imitation. And what you see here is a robot being taken by the hand where we showed a ball a bouncing task where you have a string, oops, sorry, where you have a string, um, where you have a, okay, where you have a string connecting the ball to the robot. And the robot basically will, in a moment, um, reproduce this task basically perfectly. Now, we were actually surprised that this worked directly by mutation, because a really, really good master student who implemented this first, tried to implement this with hand coding, and he never got it to work reliably by just hand coding, while by mutation learning, it actually worked out of the box and was just an afternoon's work. Now, after imitation, of course, imitation is never enough. Think about your first tennis lesson. Teacher takes you by the hand, shows you this is a forehand, this is a backhand, and it takes you 300 trials to get the first ball over the net. So what should we do? Well, of course, reinforcement learning, self-improvement. So again, we take the robot by the hand, we give it an initial solution which is good enough to actually get started. And subsequently, we um, allow it to self-improve. Now, I should add here that, um, that we give it, of course, a numerical reward based on the minimum proximity of sheets between ball and cup. And after about 40-something trials, it makes it for the first time in rim with a ball into the cup. After about 90 trials, it becomes perfect, and you can really let it run for hours and hours with a 100% success rate. So how does this compare to humans? Well, my PhD student went to find out and he did a very biased sample in his family of about 28 people. And these, among these 28 um, persons, he figured out that the uh, six to eight year olds don't manage to learn the task at all. The 10 to 12 year olds take 30 trials, so they were better than this algorithm. We had a later algorithm which managed to do it in seven or eight trials, in fact. Um, and um, while well, grown-ups manage usually to do it within three, four trials. So it was only me who took three months to learn it. Important difference, the human subject got a chocolate reward and sometimes cheated. <laughs> now, with this we can learn elementary behaviors, but of course, in order to do more things, we need modularity, and for that we require many such primitives and um, learn these by both demonstrations and by a, from imitation and by reinforcement learning. And for that, you could start with a table tennis task. Again, taking the robot by the hand and um, showing it how to do a forehand, or different forehands. Then you need to do something pretty complicated if you show many trials, because in that case, you get a very long trajectory, which, or many long trajectories, which need to be segmented so that you um, recognize what kind of primitives you see reoccurring, build up a primitive library, and then only during execution, you actually have already the uh, uh, probabilistic trajectory generator depending on your incoming stimuli. And well, once you have such data, you can, for example, take a table tennis task and get very nicely different stages of a forehand and of a backhand, as well as in a, a different kind of awaiting stages. You can use such data then um, and train by mutation learning an initial policy. And well, what you see here is how it self-improves against the ball gun, where the ball gun is specifically aimed at a location where the robot is particularly bad. And after about, well, after relatively few trials, it usually manages to uh, rewire its policy and um, create substantially better behavior. G against the ball gun, we managed to get up to 97% success rate on forehands. Subsequently, we noticed that it did not like to switch to backhands. For, in order to fix that, we needed a very important component, one component which was mentioned a couple of times today already. We need to actually predict the intention of the human. As it turns out, pro we were only told this by professional table tennis players, that they are trained to look at the ball, uh, not, uh, to not look at the ball, but at the opponent. And if you, in addition, decode um, whether, it's gonna, whether the person wants to play a forehand or backhand, before he even has touched 
the ball with this racket a single time, you can very, very safely select between forehands and backhands. And a, for, and a learned model on the human actually gives you the strength, which you can use as an additional feature then subsequently for your policy. But I'll <laughs> save you that video. This here is just using the forehand, and it's the robot playing against its maker. Katarina said she learned table tennis for a PhD, and I usually like to say the robot is about as good as she is. You can learn now various other things um, using the same approach, where we here have a, well, a basic eggplant cutting task, but the biggest difficulty is really that learning to hold the eggplant and learning how to hold the knife properly actually turned out to be a medium scale nightmare for the demonstrator, not so much as for the, even for the robot, um, since the ro doing that with kinesthetic teach-in. Nevertheless, the, well, the robot does an okay job for its hardware, I would say. Clearly, it needs more compliant hands. I mean, more actually mechanical, materials-wise compliant hands. After that, we actually recognize that the key next step has to be that when you learn you now a policy with many primitives, you actually need to have a way that the robot can explain to the user what kind of series of primitive it will be executing. And even worse, we want to do this interaction with the human. And for that reason, we went for, well, this kind of tic-tac-toe task, where we started to learn now policies, but policies which come along, oh, I apologize, you can't really see this here, um, which come along with a grammar, which is extracted from the data, where the robot has learned from imitation learning and reinforcement learning how to create such a grammar, and um, with this can play, well, tic-tac-toe against the human, and as most importantly, always tell the human, well, in this case, actually, in a, well, in a sentence on a screen, uh, where what the robot will be doing through speech interface, this may actually be more useful for the, for the actual user. Maybe we should hook up with the Tamim here, who also now is transferring knowledge to natural language processing and from internal representations. So this basically has allowed us to get policies which explain themselves, but we recognized at that point that we at some point have to also start avoiding, the, but that we have to start avoiding real data. And um, that's a little bit like throwing the baby out with the water. But for, it, since it basically means that we need some form of simulators or learned forward models, and with this comes an enchilada of problems. In fact, a few weeks ago, something happened in my lab which happened, it happened to me as a, as a young postdoc also initially. And that is, I trained something in a, uh, in a simulator, and it looked perfect in the simulator, and in the moment where I ran it on the robot, the robot made bang, went into the joint limits and broke. Now luckily my students are much smarter, for to them it happened, but they actually had a software check to, um, to hold the robot before it breaks into, uh, before it breaks, so my students wanted to use a deep neural network to learn an inverse dynamics model of this robot, which is, should be very, is a actually very simple task, and you wanted to use the inverse dynamics model learned on the simulator directly on the real robot, which in this case did exactly what it did many years ago for, um, for me, it went into the joint limits right away. And this is a fundamental problem when you're dealing with when you're dealing with learned policies which are building on top of simulators and on top of especially also learned simulators and learned forward models. It's, it has the and again it has a very good background in statistics, since all models are wrong, some are useful, but it's actually a very limited part. So what's wrong about um, training and simulation? Well. The big problem in simulation is that we are fundamentally flawed when we train in simulation. You can actually prove that a policy learned, like this one here, which is learned on an estimated number of samples, and we now estimate the best policy parameters, and we compare this to the, we compare this to the true optimal policy, that we will always overestimate the return. It's kind of a little bit of jumping to uh, conclusions right away when you're, when you're following an argument. In the same way, you have this 
really provably in uh, when you're applying simulation. Now it's not totally super difficult, super bad because this bias decreases with the number of samples, and you can make a lot of good statements about it. But all over this difference between the, this this clear optimization bias is a fundamental limit, and since we're guaranteed to be wrong. Oh my god, now I have to hurry up. Um, there are two ways of solving this. One is to actually create learning algorithms that can specifically deal with this scenario, and the other one is to partition learning into a simulated and a real world. And for that, we focused especially on grasping, which is very, very hard to simulate, where we had this fantastic thing that we worked with a neuroscientist who taught us that humans do not do any of the grasping roboticists do, but instead that they would use either they did single finger grasping like this, this neuroscience Benedine in Sweden. Yeah, great. Um, that they, it either whether you do this with one finger, whether you do it with multiple fingers, can I have two minutes extra? <laughs> Fantastic. So um, basically, that when you use one finger manipulation, two finger manipulation, or even if um, Tommy would now come that we together do this, it's the same control law. And it doesn't feel any different at all um, whether you use your finger or your opponent's or well, your, your friend's finger or two fingers from the different hands, hands of your own hand. And we learned with the just single finger control laws and subsequently we could do many different multi-finger grasps on two different robots' hands, uh, two finger, three finger, four finger, five finger grasp. And that shields us, of course, from the problem of um, having to learn the movement policy separate from the, it uh, shields us from the problem of actually having to simulate all the scenarios for the movement policies, because the, sim the finger stabilizers can actually take over the task. And what we basically then have is an upper la level, which can either be learned easier in imi by imitation, as you see here, or subsequently can be learned by, in, can be learned in simulation, purely kinematically, because the most complex thing about contact is taken care of by the finger stabilizers. So here you see the demonstration and um, subsequent behaviors is learned by imitation learning, which where there was no just kinematic behaviors transferred to the robot. You can also even do things like turning, which work on the robot despite the complexity of such kind of turning -ning scenarios right away. Without relearning, open loop. So with that, I am at the end of, uh, and at the end I would say it's not all table tennis, but I think the key thing why we need learning is that present day robots are made for repeating the same tasks thousands of times. Future robots will have to do thousands of tasks several times. And at the moment, we adapt the environment to the robot. In the future, we plan to adapt the robot to the environment, and I do hope strongly for Sami that we are right here and that his, his machine, Munich School of Robotics and Machine Intelligence, will make all the difference. With that, thank you.